Hey Foothills, I'm really excited to be teaching 2 Samuel chapter 7 today. And I want to get right into it. And the first verse is something that we can easily read over, but I want to pause there for a moment. It says, Now it came about when the king lived in his house, and the Lord had given him rest on every side from all his enemies. And this rest is true good rest. Now we've all experienced fake rest. And that could come about in, in a few different ways. But here we see that David was a good steward of the call that God had on his life. He had accomplished the task that God has put before him. And because of that, he had rest on every side from all his enemies. And so th that really is something we should aim for, where we can do the things God has called us to do. And, and maybe not completely, right? Our goal is not to do that and just keel over, but to do it for the week, for the six days we have, so that on that seventh day, we can truly rest. And so David does that. And then let's see how he responds. Like, what, what does he do next? And it says in verse 2 that the king said to Nathan the prophet, See, now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells within tent curtains. Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that it is in your mind, for the Lord is with you. So get this. In this rest, this true, this good rest, David considers the Lord. He uses that time to really ask himself, All right, how can I now further worship and pursue what God has. Now, I, I don't know about you, but I am prone to when it is rest time, when it, I'm, I'm done with work, it's me time. And I could, too often, I can make that something where it, it's a little bit more about me than, or a lot of bit more about me than it should be. And so I can unplug from work, and sometimes I can unplug from God. And, and that's not true good rest. You know, God gives us that rest. That's how we're able to enter into it. And so we, we shouldn't leave him out of it. And David here, he pursues the Lord. It reminds me a few months into COVID and everything going on, Mark DuPont came to staff and he challenged us. He said, a lot of people are asking right now, what am I missing because I don't get to be in person at, for church on Sunday mornings? And he said, the question we should be asking is, what is the Lord missing? You know, every Sunday we have opportunities to receive so much as we gather together and hear the word and, and fellowship with other believers. But also we have an even greater opportunity to go before the Lord and give him praise and worship of which he's very deserving. And so that perspective change, it, it means everything. And David here, he's using this rest to ask himself, all right, now in this rest, now that I have peace from all enemies, from all sides, what can I do for the Lord? And so he, he wants to build the Lord a temple. He realizes he lives in a house of cedars. Just so you know, there are no cedar forests all around Jerusalem. That means they were brought there. His house, his palace is a nice one. It's an expensive one. And the Lord's ark is in a tabernacle. It's in a tent that travels around. It is not firmly established. And that's what's worked, but David now wants to build the, build the Lord a temple. We find out in verses 4 through 7 that the Lord speaks to Nathan the prophet and tells him he's supposed to go to David and say, hey, this is actually not for you to accomplish. And, and I want to, we learn in 1 Chronicles, the reason for that is because David has a lot of blood on his hands. And that sounds pretty gnarly and kind of bad, but David was used by God to defeat a lot of really evil people. And in that process, he got a lot of blood on his hands. And so it's easy for us to see from a humanly, from a fleshly perspective, well, God, David did what he was called to do. He followed your orders. And because of that, he's disqualified from doing this for you. And that's not the way the Lord looks at it. You know, God doesn't want any one of us to do everything, but he wants all of us to do the thing that he's called us to do. And together, we can accomplish a ton for his name and for his kingdom. And that's what he has for David. He said, David, this is what I've called you to do, to, to establish this kingdom, to defeat these enemies. And the temple, I have that for someone else. 
And David didn't get all frustrated and mad. He didn't like have Nathan executed, anything like that. In fact, we learn later on, David continued drawing up the plans for the temple. He gathered all the supplies so that he could help someone else accomplish that task. Talk about a really kingdom-minded teamwork right there. So Nathan says, David, I don't have, God says to David through Nathan rather, I don't have you to build this temple, but he doesn't simply say no. And there's things you might want to do, and God has given you a no, but if you listen clearly, it's not, it's not a no period. It's a no comma. Because the way God operates is he says, no, I don't want you to do that, but I have something better. And here God says, and we're going to read from 8 to like 14. It's, it's a little bit, it's a good chunk, but it's worth it because God is saying, no, I don't want you to build something for me that's physical, but instead I want to give you something that is spiritual and eternal. So let's pick up verse 8. It says, Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, that's God to Nathan, Nathan says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and have have cut off your enemies from before you, and I will make you a great name, like the names of the great men who are on the earth. So he's reminding David how faithful God has been to him throughout his entire life, really. He goes on, he says, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them, that they may live in their own place and not be disturbed again, nor will the wicked afflict them any more as formerly. That's really rad. Israel has traveled. They haven't had a capital. And David, part of him establishing the temple in his mind was he could establish a place for God's people to always be. God says that's going to happen. But he goes on, and in verse 11 at the end, he says, But the Lord also declares to you that the Lord will make a house for you. Verse 12, When your days are complete and you lie down, With your fathers, I will raise up your descendants after you, who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. And he shall build a house for my name. Your your son will build the temple, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. You know, it might be difficult to to read there, but what God is saying is, David, I'm going to establish in your lineage, through your legacy, a kingdom that will never end. And so your son's going to build the temple, but even more than that, his son will rule, and his son will rule. And we know that Jesus, who rules and will always rule, came from David's lineage. How incredible is this, that because David was a good steward of what God had given him and the call that God had placed upon his life, he entered into rest. Because he used that rest to honor the Lord, he was given this vision And as he used that time to exalt God, God said, whoa, thank you. In that humility, I'm going to exalt you. Now, David recognizes that this is an incredible gift. In fact, we talk about this. We refer to it as the Davidic covenant. And it is a really important and great promise God gave David. So David responds with a prayer of thanks. And I want to read just a couple verses from it. It says, my my page dropped, sorry about that, but it says uh, in verse 18, then David the king went in and sat before the Lord, and he said, who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house that you have brought me this far? Yet this was insignificant in your eyes, O Lord God, for you have spoken also of the house of your servant concerning the distant future. He goes on in verse 22 to say, you are great, O Lord God, for there is none like you. And there is no God besides you according to all that we have heard with our ears. Man, this is such a cool chapter. And our takeaway from it, my my challenge for you is to steward your time, steward your calling properly to the glorifying of of God's name and his purpose and, and the expanding of his kingdom. And as you do that, I guarantee the Lord will be with you and he will bless you. Until next time.